I want to speak to you again this morning. We're, we're talking about avoiding confusion, avoiding confusion, inter interpreting cultural issues through a biblical worldview. And so we're going to get into some of those cultural issues, I promise you that. But in these first few lessons, we're trying to lay the foundation. What is our foundation for having a biblical worldview? Well, it's got to be the Bible, doesn't it? It has to be the Word of God. One of the names that is given to this book that I hold in my hand right here is the Word of God. And that's, that's a pretty big claim to make, isn't it? That's a pretty big statement to make for, for us to be able to say, I hold in my hand the Word of God. This is not a book by man. This is the very Word of God. And what does it mean when we make that statement or make that claim that we have the Word of God? And how do we know that it's a true statement? And if it is true, how should it affect our lives? You see, we've got to have confidence that we have a book that is truly the Word of God. And so there's important questions to ask and important questions to answer. If we're going to allow the Bible to inform our, or, or help form our worldview, then we must learn more about the origin of God's Word and be confident that we can place our trust fully in it. So in this lesson this morning, I think this is the fifth, the fifth week that we're beginning to study these things. And today I want to talk to you about the reliability of the Bible. The reliability of the Bible. Can you trust it? Can you be able to say with confidence, I believe I have the Word of God and this is what I can use to, to govern and influence my thinking. How I view the world, how I think about things. I believe we can. And so I want to talk to you this week and next Sunday as well about the reliability of the Bible. Our text verses as we begin the lesson today are found there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. You have them there in your handout. Of course, you're welcome to open up your Bible also. But God's Word tells us here in 2 Timothy, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly uh, furnished unto all good works. I believe we have the Word of God. And it was given to us by inspiration of God. Satan has made attacks on the Word of God ever since he first uh, attempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. The attack on God's words began not just... 100 years ago, 150 years ago, it began in the Garden of Eden. When Satan came to Eve, the serpent came to Eve and began to try to get her to question, did God really say that? Are you sure that's God's words? Are you sure about what he said? So Satan has always been on the attack against his word. The challenge of God's word was the very basis for his temptation to Eve there in the Garden of Eden. Satan questioned God's words and got Eve to doubt what God had said. Notice there Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle, sneaky and so on, subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yay, hath God said? Did God really say that? H hath God said he shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan was encouraging Eve to doubt God's words with a simple question there. Hath God said? Did God really say that? Are, are you sure that that's God's words? In the same manner, Satan often suggests to us that the Bible is not God's word, that it's not true. He may try to tell us that we have no means to verify the accuracy of the scriptures. And so we don't really need to obey it because you, you're not even sure that it's God's word. But Satan's a liar, always has been a liar. History has revealed continuing attempts to question God's word. Many of these attempts have, have weakened or diminished the faith of God's people. As recently as the 20th century, theological liberalism swept through Europe and then the United States of America and Canada, dramatically changing the landscape of mainline denominations. At the heart of these discussions and changes were challenges to the accuracy of the Bible. Can you trust the Bible? 
It caused a lot of people to doubt God's Word. Seminaries, theologians, even pastors began to question the inspiration of Scripture. Well, the God who has told us, this is my Word. It was inspired. It was given by me. But people began to doubt what God said, even that it was His Word. People began to question the inspiration of Scripture. They began to question the facts of the Bible, including its miracles and including the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The deity being the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus wasn't just a moral man. No, Jesus is God. Many people began to doubt that. To begin to uh, doubt the deity of Christ. To begin to deny the virgin birth of Christ and different things. Some suggested that entire sections of the Bible should be removed from it. That, well, that's, we can't trust that. This questioning of Scripture continues today. Due to the influence of secularism, many people, even sometimes in, in Bible preaching churches, have been led astray and have, ex have accepted false views about God and the Bible. One person wrote this, Secularism has desensitized many people that are sitting in the chairs in gospel preaching churches, leading them to even hold to, to heretical doctrines. Heretical meaning things that are heresy, things that are false, things that are not true. Again, if you begin to doubt God's Word, you, you, you'll, you may start believing all kinds of things. If you don't have, know that you have something sure that you can trust in and say, this is reliable, this is God's Word. Although many people deny the historical accuracy in the truth of the scriptures, they do so without having any credible or legitimate reasons for it. One biblical scholar wrote this, the evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical, so-called classical authors in the world. The authenticity of which no one would dream of questioning. If the, New, if the New Testament were just some collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. In other words, what he was saying was that you may have some secular writings. You may have some people who, who in, in around that same period of history, they were writing poetry. They were writing literature. They were writing things. And people don't question, you know, the, the, the authenticity of that or for us to be able to say all these years later, this was written by so-and-so. People don't doubt that. But it's amazing how people attack the Bible. It's amazing how people attack the credibility of the Bible and who it was written by and where it came from and, and can it be trusted and is it the Word of God. People insist on denying the credibility of the Bible. There was a, a Christian lady that was seated, to a, seated next to a skeptic on an airplane. A skeptic, a doubter. Somebody that didn't want to trust the Bible. They would mock the Bible. They would make fun of the Bible. And so this born-again Christian lady was on the airplane, and she, was, she had her Bible open on the plane, and she was reading the Bible. And the person sitting next to her, the man next to her, said, Oh, you don't really believe all that stuff in the Bible, do you? She said, Of course I do. And he said, Well, what about that guy that was swallowed by a whale? Surely you don't believe in that. How do you suppose he survived all that time? The woman responded that she didn't exactly know how he managed to survive in the, in the belly of the whale. But that she would ask Jonah about it one day when she got to heaven. And the man said, ha! You're going to ask Jonah about it one day when you get to heaven. Well, what if he's not in heaven? And she said, well, then you can ask him. You think about that for a moment and you'll get it. <laughs> you'll, you'll get it if you think about it. In other words, you know where the, that guy's going to end up, okay? The other place, all right? In Fierno, all right? Although many people doubt or deny the reliability of the Bible, we, we have a lot of reasons why we can trust this Bible is God's Word. God inspired it. God gave it. God has preserved it for us. And in this lesson, we want to study some things about the inspiration of the Scriptures so we can be strong in our belief in God and our confidence in the Word of God. Number one there in your notes is this, the reliability of the Bible. The reliability of the Bible. If you're filling in the blanks there in your notes, number one, the reliability of the Bible. The Bible itself claims to be a reliable source of truth coming directly from God Himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it tells us this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It teaches us what is right. Profitable for reproof tells us what's not 
right. For correction, telling us how to get things right. Instruction in righteousness, how to continue doing right and keep things right in our lives and so on. But let's, let's break down this verse. So we have the reliability of the Bible, number one, under that letter A, inspired words. Inspired words. The Bible was given by inspiration of God. These are inspired words. The, these are not just some books that some person with a, with a fair idea thought, I'll, I'll tell certain stories, I'll say certain things. You know, Curtis Hudson, I, I, I wish I would have thought back and gone back and listened to it. Curtis Hudson was a wonderful preacher uh, many years ago. He died uh, with cancer in the 1990s, 1995 or 96 maybe. I heard him preach many times as a boy. He was a very eloquent speaker. But he used to say some things about the Word of God. That, you know, man, man is so sinful and wicked that we would have never written a book so good even if we could have. Even if we could have thought and dreamed of something, we wouldn't have written a book so good. God's Word is amazing. God's Word is wonderful. And I believe it wasn't just thoughts of men, but it was the Word of God. It was inspired by God. God's Holy Spirit was impressing upon people what He wanted them to, to write down, to give us His words, the things He wanted us to know. So we have, number one, the reliability of the Bible, and under that letter A, inspired words. The Greek word for inspiration means God breathed. God breathed. This definition is paralleled in the English phrase, inspiration of God. Our English word inspire has multiple definitions. In this case, it uses the definition of, of inspiration, meaning to breathe into something. God, God inspired it. God breathed into it. God, it was God given. It was God's word. God gave life to it. And we believe we have a book that's a living book, a powerful book. Uh, words that can convict and words that can make an incredible difference in someone's life. This is the way in which God gave the scriptures. Just as God breathed life into Adam and he became a living soul, God breathed life into his words. In turn, these words give life to all men who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what the Bible says there in John chapter 6 and verse uh, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. But the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The Bible is a living book. It's a living book. It's an alive book. It's a powerful book. This is a book that someone can read it, and, and it can just do something in their heart. It can speak to them in a way that another book cannot speak to them. It's God's living word. He breathed life into it. And the Spirit of God can use this word to bring conviction to a soul, to bring conviction to a heart. He can use his word to bring comfort to the heart of a person who's hurting or sorrowing or grieving. God's Word is an amazing book. It's a living book. You know, sometimes this Word can be like a... a, a uh, it can bring us conviction. It, it can be like a sword, the Bible says, that would pierce to our heart. The Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is quick, meaning it's alive. It's a living book. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Wow, must be a pretty sharp book, isn't it? He says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It can pierce, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word, you could read it or you could hear it and it could, could pierce right to speak to your very heart, to convict you about something, to comfort you about something, to help you about something. God's word is powerful. The Bible is also compared in the book of Peter to being like an, an incorruptible seed that will never die. Just as a physical seed produces a plant and then fruit, God's word can produce fruit. God's word can produce new life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
How is it? How is it that God breathed life into his word? How did God breathe his word into existence? Although God is the author of scriptures, he did use human writers to record it, to write it down. The Bible tells us this. Is it in your notes? 2 Peter 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't men writing down what they wanted to write down, their thoughts. It says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God. While skeptics and scoffers and critics often claim that the Bible is just man's opinions because it came through the pens of human writers, this is a misleading and even a logical claim. Think about it this way. The Bible was recorded by a about 40 different people, 40 human writers from a variety of different backgrounds and occupations. It was written over a period of approximately 1,500 years. It was written in three different languages. It was written on three different continents. And it covers hundreds of controversial subjects. Yet the entire Bible, written by 40 writers over 1,500 years, three languages, which is three different continents, all has one theme, one message. Why? Because it has one author. It was written by many men over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but it's consistent all the way through. Why? Because it wasn't men's writings. It was God's Word being given to us so we could learn about our Creator, learn about the God of this universe. Learn about the one who longs to have a relationship with you. There's only one author who spans every age and language and location and subject, and that is God himself. There was only one author, and that was God, God the Holy Spirit. He moved men to write what he wanted them to write, yet he used each person's words and writing styles. The writers themselves expressed an awareness that, that the Scripture, it wasn't just their words, but that it was, it was God actually speaking through them. It was God's word, not their own thoughts. David was used of God to write some of the the largest portions of the scripture and he claimed that it was God that was giving him those words he says this in 2nd Samuel 23 in verse 2 the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his words was in my tongue that's a, that's a strong statement. But that's what David said. It was the Spirit of God that was speaking through me. When these Psalms were written, it was God speaking through me. The, these words were inspired by Him. Our family read some books, some wonderful David Chronicles. And sometimes in those books, it, it referenced this and made, made, you know, referred to that. It's because of that verse. Right? David said, it wasn't just me. There was this sense that it was God speaking through me. It was God giving me these words to sing to him. Right? So God inspired those words. God inspired the Psalms. God inspired Genesis. God inspired the book of Proverbs. God inspired the book of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. It, it, it was given by him. There were also New Testament writers who quoted verses from the Old Testament. They claimed those words to be the word of God, revealing that they considered the Old Testament to be inspired scriptures. When they quoted things from the Old Testament, they believed this is the word of God. It wasn't just the writing of some men. There, there are over 320 quotations from the Old Testament recorded in the New Testament, as well as over a thousand clear and definite, definite references to things in the Old Testament. Always the context indicates that the belief of the, the speaker or the writer, that, they, that what they were referring to or quoting even, that this was the Word of God. That this was the word of God. The Bible is reliable because it has been given by a divine author who spoke through human writers. And we can trust it to provide the truth and direction that we need. Letter B in your notes there, write this, inerrant facts. Inerrant facts. That, that means it's without error. It is inerrant. There is no error in it. 
inerrant facts. Looking back to 2 Timothy 3.16, we saw from the beginning of the verse that the Bible is given by inspiration of God. But the verse further states that the Bible is profitable for us. It's profitable for significant areas of our life. The Bible is a very unique book in that it is inerrant. It literally says nothing that errs from the truth. It is without error. Although the purpose of the Bible wasn't to record all of history or to teach science, where it does state facts regarding history, science, or any other subject, it is always without error. That's not true about some other books. I have something at home that, that shows some things about the Quran. And it shows places where the Quran is wrong. Muhammad was wrong because Muhammad wasn't inspired by God. He was just writing his opinion about some things. And so it shows at times his opinion about some things that maybe physically or medically or science or, or the universe where he was wrong. We, we know it's wrong as we've, as we've progressed and all these years later, science and, and telescopes and all kinds of things have proven what the world is like and what the universe is like and, and different things. But the Bible does not have errors like that in it. Why? Because it's God's word. It is God's word. I want you to notice a few of the unique aspects of the Bible in relation to some facts. It is the only book of antiquity that gives an account of special creation of all things out of nothing. The Bible is the only ancient book that gives a continuous historical record from the first man to the present era. Era. We find accurate descriptions of historical events and people throughout the Bible. The Bible is the only religious book containing detailed prophecies of events that at the time of the writing had not yet happened, but which since then they have been fulfilled. Because wh why, why could the Bible always be accurate in its prophecy? Because it was written by God. It was authored by God. It's God who knows the future. It's God who knows what's going to happen. And so the prophecies of scriptures have always proven themselves true. Why? Because they weren't written by men. Yes, they were recorded by men, but they were authored by God. From a historic standpoint, it is amazing to see how Scripture recounts history, which modern-day historians are only recently catching up with. There are th things some, sometimes that the Bible speaks about historically of, or certain groups of people that only today can archaeologists sometimes begin to dig and dig and dig and see things from previous generations. And, oh, there, there really was a certain people and so on. There really was a certain civilization or a certain type of people. See, sometimes it takes these people years and thousands of years now to be able to prove with archaeology and something that the Bible spoke about and we had recorded for us. Listen, you don't have to doubt God's word. You can trust it. You, you can believe it. For instance, for years, historians questioned the biblical account of a people known as the Hittites, as well as the Babylonian king Belshazzar. In both instances, skeptics said since there was no evidence of, of either of these, that the biblical authors had just simply made them up. It must be that, well, in the Bible, they just made up some things about some certain people. They made up these things about Babylon. They made up these things about these kings. No, they didn't make up any of that. What the Bible says is true. It's reliable. You can count on it. If it speaks of a certain people, then those people existed. Those people lived in the Middle East and so on. Over time, archaeological uh, discoveries have revealed material proof for these people and stories. These confirmations, thousands of years after the events were record recorded, should assure us that we can trust the Bible's historical accuracy even before archaeology catches up to the Bible and what the Bible speaks about history. From a scientific standpoint, we can see that Scripture recorded accurate scientific facts even before they were discovered by man. For example, it was a common belief during the Middle Ages that the earth was flat. But the Bible has always taught us otherwise. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22 tells us, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Long before Sir Isaac Newton discovered gravity and what gravity did and, and its pull and so on, God had already told us about the gravitational pull of the earth. Newton simply was realizing what God 
had already told us in the scriptures. In the book of Job, chapter 26 and verse 7, it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. You know, our knowledge about the earth, it matters to God. The one who created the earth, he knows everything about it. And he has chosen to reveal some of that to us. One day he can explain it all to us. One day we can see it from his perspective. But he has chosen to reveal some things to us from his word. And in everything that God said in his word, it has always been accurate scientifically and historically and so on. It's never wrong. It's inerrant. It is, it is without error. And then let her see today, I want you to see this, infallible truth. Infallible truth. One of the best showcases for the infallibility of the scriptures is found through its prophecy and the fulfilling of prophecy. Author Henry Morris wrote this, One of the strong objective evidences of biblical inspiration is the phenomenon of fulfilled prophecy. Where God's word said that something would happen and it happened in future generations, kingdoms, and so on. The Bible is unique in this respect among all other religious books. While some may contain vague forecasts of future events, none of them hold anything comparable to the vast number of specific prophecies given in the Holy Scriptures which have later been fulfilled. Let's take a look just real quickly at the clear prophecies surrounding just the one event, and that being Christ's birth. And there's, there's actually many prophecies about that, but just a few verses about it. Some prophecies that give details about the timing of Christ's birth, the miraculous nature of Christ's birth, and the place of Christ's birth. And all of those prophecies being given hundreds of years before Jesus Christ would be born. Shouldn't that prove to us? Wait, we've got something reliable here. We've got a book that can be trusted. Why? It's God's Word. It told us where Jesus would be born. It told us what His birth would be like. It told us the general timing of it as well, and so on. A few, a few, a few examples of that. The prophet Daniel provided the specific time period of Christ's birth. It's given in the famous 70-week prophecy. In Daniel chapter 9, uh, 25 and 26, it says this, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and uh, two weeks, meaning 62 weeks and seven weeks, 69 weeks, but it's actually weeks of years, okay? It says even, uh, it says, sorry, the street shall be built again and the wall even in uh, troublous times. And after three score and uh, two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Speaking about his death and his crucifixion. Every sequence and spacing of years in this prophecy add up to Christ's crucifixion. The Messiah being cut off, but not for himself in the first century. The weeks mentioned here refer to a set of seven. In this case, it refers to sets of seven years. Another example here, the prophet Isaiah prophesied the miraculous nature of Christ's birth, that he would be born of a virgin. There in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, do you see it? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. There's never been a child born like that before on the earth, because it's impossible. But there was a miracle. There was a child being born, a child that was conceived of the Holy Spirit of God. He was the Son of God. He is Jesus. What else? The prophet Micah, he foretold the exact town of Christ's birth 750 years before Jesus came. In Micah there, chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. These examples are just a small sampling of all the specific biblical prophecies that have been executed exactly as written. God said that the Holy Scriptures contained in the Bible were given by inspiration of God. 
They were given by inspiration of God. And it is clear that the Bible is a supernatural and God-breathed book. It is high above all other literature and any opinions that this world can offer. Can you trust the Bible? Yes, you can. It is reliable. It is God's Word. We've tried to talk about some things this morning that would show you about that. We'll continue uh, next week. But I want you to know you can trust the Bible. You can believe and have confidence with all your heart that, no, this isn't just some book of men. This is the Word of God. And God's Word should be what shapes your view, what shapes your thinking, what shapes your life. Can you trust the Bible? Bible. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Caleb, this is God's Word. This is God's Word. You know what the Bible is? God's Word. You know who Jesus is? God's Son. You can always believe that. You can have confidence in that. Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us. Would you strengthen our faith and our confidence to believe that we have something sure, something reliable, something we can build our lives upon. Thank you, God, for giving us your Word. Thank Thank you for how you miraculously inspired your word. You breathed it into existence. You breathed life into the, the words that were being written down by these men. You were uh, telling them, the Spirit of God was prompting them and telling them what to write down. And he was even guiding their hands as they were writing it down, that they were recording the very words of God for us. God, because you loved us and you wanted us to know some things about yourself. You wanted us to know your plan. You wanted us to know your purpose. You wanted us to know the reason for our existence. And so, God, I thank you for giving us your word. Help us to build our lives upon it. In Jesus' name I pray.